Clementine Duboff is an associate director of Kia and will be accompanied by Jonathan Ross, Cruz, and Sarah Briganti. You have the floor. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Um, first, I would like to thank the Portuguese Presidency of the Council of the EU for the invitation, as well as the Ministry of Culture, for also enabling me to travel and be here physically with you today. I think it adds a lot also to the human dimension, which is at the very core of our topic um, today. Um, I actually had prepared a very, uh, let's say, standard uh, introduction uh, for this, uh, this plenary panel, and I will do, if you allow me, a little deviation to this initial plan. Uh, we've talked a lot, and we have to talk about this, the macro impact of culture uh, on our European community, on our national and local communities, but I would like to start by a little personal story and a very individual one. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was in Brussels where I live and I found in a bookshop an illustrated book, a very simple uh, one uh, with few texts and wonderful pictures. And actually this book uh, had a really emotional impact on me. Uh, and a very, I had a very emotional reaction to uh, my reading and I thought, uh, why is this doing this to me and what can it what does it bring to me and and of course it's about reflections on our uh, state of mind on our current daily lives maybe on the state of the planet uh, but i thought that this very initial uh, emotional response was it it was this is what culture and what is what art is about and then after searching on the internet a bit about this book, I found that millions of people have read it and it has also been used or uh, shown in hospitals, in prisons, in care homes. Um, so I was obviously not the only one to be touched uh, so um, profoundly by this book. Uh, and then I thought, okay, this might be where it starts, no? the social impact of culture. It starts with one anecdotal individual story, uh, most in insignificant, and then it goes to the world and we share this emotion. So I would like just to uh, ask us to, all together today to remember in our very uh, serious discussions about the impact of culture, to remember that spark, to remember that emotion and that very personal feeling that our encounters with it within a museum, with, with a book, in, in a theater, at the cinema, uh, what does that 
do to us. And I would like to, yeah, to remind us to think about culture and art not as an abstract concept we need to discuss, uh, but really as something we can feel and experience. So this uh, was my little deviation to, to my initial plan. Uh, but without further ado, maybe I'll do, say a few words about our, our current topic. Um, the social impact of culture is something that is, uh, has been coming up and increasingly uh, mentioned in policy strategies, in narratives, in plan, in projects, and this is especially true at European level. Uh, we have the, the new agenda for culture and we have the council conclusions on the work plan for culture, where cultural inclusion, impact, accessibility, inclusion is mentioned, and this is something that is, uh, we can be happy about this fact that it's coming up more more and more in policy plans and in projects and we have wonderful cultural projects happening all over Europe on this theme. Um, so if the, the topic of today's conference is to, uh, to explore this topic and, and to inspire also policy recommendations, uh, we'll have a couple of, uh, of panels to explore this very much in depth and the different uh, transformation aspect that culture can have on society uh, in the program. And I take the opportunity of this opening plenary session with uh, my distinguished guests to explore some of the underlying concepts of uh, the cultural impact uh, on, on society. So I'm very glad to be uh, today on, on stage with uh, Sarah Baranga Briganti from the National Plan for Culture with Hugo Cruz, who's a practitioner, and also to be joined remotely by uh, Jonathan Gross from the King's College in London. Um, and I will let you introduce yourselves in a couple of minutes, and I will ask you most specifically just an introductory question, which I will take my paper to be sure I'm reading right. Um, so I would like to start with Hugo, because you're a researcher, but you're also a practitioner, and you've worked on social and community uh, arts. And I would like in your presentation to insist uh, and, and tell us more about your perception and your practice uh, of cultural participation. Good morning. First of all, I would like to greet all those present here, those face-to-face -face and those virtually present. And of course, I would like to thank the Portuguese Presidency of the European Union for the invitation to be here and to participate in this panel. As a summary of what we have been doing in our life is um, complex in just a few minutes. I have been mostly working in the field of participative uh, and community artistic practices, uh, uh, art and policy creations, uh, policies. I've been as a creator, someone who has been fortunate to meet very different communities at very different places. I have been working at schools, jailhouses, social neighborhoods, uh, social security uh, institutions and cultural institutions as well. In terms of cultural programming, I'm currently developing uh, the arts director, arts management of the program Culture for All in several municipalities and I'm also the artistic director of the International Encounter of Art and Community I'm sorry, I'll have to remove the mask. It's complicated to breathe while speaking. I feel freer now. You are all wearing masks. I would like to say that I'm the, the manager of Meishu that will take place here at Porto um, at the end of the year and will happen for the first time also in Lisbon and Brazil, the MESH, the International Meeting of Art and Community. In terms of research, I would highlight the last four years dedicated within the scope of my uh, PhD to develop three studies on the uh, community art practices and civil and political participation involving over 330 people and 31 groups so it, that is also what I will be talking about. 
besides the consultancy and external assessment work of the parties initiative and of the uh, Carlos Kubanka Foundation, the Akasha Foundation, and uh, I think that is a brief presentation. Brief introduction of myself. As for cultural participation, if I may, I would like to make a current status assessment to contextualize that which will somehow be my positioning throughout this dialogue. I would start by saying that when we talk about cultural participation, we get the idea that it is somehow um, addressing a more participative uh, um, intervention. When I'm talking about participative or participatory and community activities, I'm talking about a more direct participation and interaction with the art through by citizens. So I think it's very important to clarify this because I like to talk about the cultural and artistic participation, highlighting also that component, uh, facing the risk that may be a uh, repetition, but I want it to be, well, very clear. So I will be telling you more about cultural and artistic participation, much closer to the principles of cultural democracy, which, as we know, proposes access to forms of promotion and creation and takes a step forward in relation to the cultural democratic principles, much closer to what we call, in general, cultural participation, more in the sense proposed uh, of access to cultural enjoyment, cultural fruition. It seems to be needed as there is a lot of confusion when we are talking about cultural participation and of course the topic of this panel. There is a lot of confusion and it's important to clarify our vocabulary as we are often talking about the same thing using different words or using the same words talking about very different things which makes it harder to establish true dialogue and participation. Having said this, I think it is very important, even regarding the topic of the panel, to talk about social impact and artistic value. It is a classic discussion, the idea of art through art and art as a social uh, function. It's a classical idea in a more extreme way. probably the most relevant that should be thought about, not only in terms of narrative, but most of all in practice and routine for cultural institutions, uh, we should think about how we integrate this value and this impact, which is an intrinsic uh, impact of art and culture deeply related with its social impacts. Precisely because it is a cultural and art approach, and given the forms of production of experience and knowledge which are specific, that it is also possible for this approach to have a social impact. I believe it is extremely relevant for us to make sure that the approaches happen from the artistic and cultural point of view until we want a dialogue and complementary in nature that will guarantee a positive effect in terms of social and cultural impact, something I usually underline. Regarding participation, we would have a lot to say, but this is a dialogue talking about the supposed crisis of participation, the frailness of democracy, and how we often see participation as a panacea for all problems in current democracies, knowing that very often these participatory processes do not involve the citizens in defining uh, what will be this participatory process and their construction, and that is fundamental. I will also be telling you about the quality of cultural and art participation. Uh, at this time in our history, as mankind, 
once again we have a lot of appetite to discuss the social impact of culture. It happens often and it's good that it's so. It's important to understand how contemporary art creation has been growingly more participatory and how the social and the educational and health and environmental fields have also been bringing art languages to consolidate their goals. So it seems to be relevant that we understand how we can create and strengthen a hybrid field that should be diversified, and that is its richness. And if we try a homogeneous approach that does not respect diversity, different aesthetics, and above all does not take into consideration the questioning of a pre-established hierarchy between different aesthetics, very probably we will not be able to take advantage of the gap that this pandemic opened up for structural changes and I think it's enough for now. <laughs> Many thanks Hugo, that is uh, already quite a, a lot of, uh, of ideas uh, that will be explored uh, during the, the panel. You mentioned one very important concept is the one of cultural democracy. Uh, and we are lucky to, to have another researcher uh, with us today, uh, also, although joining uh, remotely, we have uh, with us Jonathan. I don't know if uh, you can hear us. I can't see you, but I'm sure you're there. Um, so, uh, Jonathan, I will give you the, the virtual floor to present uh, yourself. Your research activities address these questions of cultural policies, of, of participation and politics. Uh, and I would also invite you to uh, complement and add on what uh, Hugo was just presenting about cultural democracy. So you have a couple of, of minutes and welcome. I think just hold on a second, Jonathan, because I think we cannot hear you very loud in the room. Sorry. And we hear some sound, but it's like it's not on the main speakers. So just hold on a, a couple of seconds. <laughs> Maybe can you try it now? No, <laughs> still not. I'm sure our technical team is doing their best. It might be coming from... No, I think it's probably not coming from your side. Yeah, we, we, hear, we, hear, we hear you on stage, but very low, so I'm, I'm sure the audience cannot hear you. So I would like to wait a couple of seconds so that this is sorted. So maybe in the meantime, I don't know if that's a, couple, a good idea to maybe uh, give the floor to Sarah while we are sorting the, the speaker's uh, issue. Um, so Sarah, you, you experimented more on the side of the implementation of, of educational and, and cultural policies. Um, and actually, uh, cultural democracy is also at the heart of what you're doing and your recent work. Um, so we'd be curious to know how uh, you capture and you Con you translate this concept into um, into your work, and of course, feel free to, to introduce yourselves in, in these minutes. So, um, primeiro, em primeiro lugar, uh, cumprimentar uh, todos os presentes. All uh, of you present uh, here, especially the minister, uh, the, the chairman of the board, também, and of course. Uh, um, Dr. Fernanda Heitor, Dr. Gepac, também agradecer esta oportunidade de partilhar ideias neste painel e um pouco daquilo que nós estamos a fazer no Plano Nacional das Artes. Eu vou falar em inglês porque preparámos toda esta conversa em inglês, ligada também com o Jonathan. Porque nós também preparámos isso com o Jonathan, então eu apologizo. 
Não, não vou falar em português. Um, so, um, first to present myself, just to say that I was um, formerly, um, I studied as an artist, and that is very important to uh, build up the way I think. And I use really uh, all the creative process artists use in order to um, empathize as well with other artists and as well with uh, all the people that work in creative processes. I was for a long time a, a teacher uh, in several um, levels of education, formal and non-formal. And more recently, uh, the past 20 years, I've been working deeply in museums and especially um, caring for uh, public services uh, for the, um, what we call the museum experience and always thinking about the social impact of museums uh, in society. So this is where I stand. And uh, very recently, two years ago, I was invited by um, the Minister of Culture uh, to be part of the um, uh, team of the National Plan for the Arts, which is a um, task force of the Ministry of Education and Culture to um, build up um, uh, the, the social impact of arts in society, especially working with uh, young people and, uh, of course, then uh, to all people as well. So cultural democracy is as well at the core of our actions. And uh, in the National Plan for the Arts, uh, it's at the core of our mission, manifest and strategy. And it means for us to build action to culturally emancipate and give voice and decision-making power to all citizens. And as well to create the conditions for the exercise of cultural citizenship to all people, for them to acknowledge that they have cultural rights and cultural duties. It means as well to transform the way the system operates into an ecosystem where everybody and every organization participates and collaborates at different levels. We follow the square kilometer concept, which is a very important concept in the National Plan for the Arts, and I believe it's truly a um, cultural democracy uh, concept. Uh, it's a proposition to develop ecosystems that interrelate culture and education at the heart of each territory as a place to belong where artists, heritage, culture are essential and endemic. This means that we work across uh, the country as well in the, the archipelagos of uh, Portugal, Madeira and Açores, uh, finding out what is uh, already there in each place. Uh, what are the, 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 thank you. What are the, the oh, I don't know if the, PowerPoint is in. I don't know how to put it there. Um, okay. Okay. Just. Yeah. Um, so, so we we work, as I was saying, in the territory, finding out um, all the endemic uh, heritage, uh, artists, um, culture forms, and art forms, and we build upon what is already there. We don't bring culture to the place we work from within, from this context. And this is very important because this uh, permits uh, culture to emerge from that context. And therefore, we don't take uh, top-down top uh, approaches. We uh, actually bring a methodology, which is our uh, way of working, and ask how can culture and art help to address the issues of that territory, of that community. And um, another uh, important um, part of our work is uh, to improve access to culture, uh, both physically, socially, and intellectually. Um, we uh, thrive to build networks and bridge gaps Actually, this is our sustainability uh, strategy because uh, the National Plan for the Arts, as you can see, it's a task force for 10 years. This means that we have five years to grow and five years 
to be able to start leaving the territory. And we can only leave the territory when uh, the territory is able to work without um, us um, working there. This means to empower people, empower institutions, and uh, as you can see, we work with, um, together with schools, uh, museums, theatres, um, cultural organisations, artists, artisans, collectives, uh, everyone who wants actually to work with us. So I, I, I like this metaphor uh, that uh, we are building a network of roots underneath the territory so that in each place a new forest, a new tree can come up. And I hope um, in three years this will be very um, visible to everyone. It's already, uh, it, it's already taking place in some, uh, some areas of Portugal, and especially when um, local governments really take action to, to work with us. And I will just uh, finish by showing you uh, the next slide, yes. Just to, to, to show uh, our compass, this is the strategy of the National Plan for the Arts. Um, it's built up in three axes uh, with five programs and 27 measures. And um, it works like, um, like a puzzle, actually. Uh, everywhere we see how can we uh, compose and integrate these measures to build up the project that needs to be um, developed from uh, the issues that, was, that were raised there. So I, I shall say this is a, a systemic approach where um, all these measurements come together to promote social change and mobilize the education power of the arts and uh, the heritage in the lives of each citizen and uh, for all and with everyone. So this will be. Yeah, ready. Thanks, Sarah. And we'll, we'll uh, have the opportunity to, to dig deeper into this, uh, this strategy and how you measure. Uh, shall we start? Uh, shall we try again uh, having Jonathan on, on stage with us? Jonathan, are you there? Yeah, we can see you, but we can still not hear you. So I don't know if there's anyone from the tech team out there who could provide support so that we can hear Jonathan's presentation. Okay, so uh, it seems, I'm, I'm so sorry, Jonathan, uh, we, we are still trying to, to get you uh, on, on stage, I mean, uh, uh, as a voice, uh, not only as a, as a picture. I will give you the floor when this is solved to uh, take it from, from the beginning uh, and then to, to join the, the conversation, but let's, uh, let's move on now. You have an idea of the concepts under, underlying uh, the social impact of culture from different perspectives with Sarah and Hugo, um, who will give us some more concrete uh, examples of uh, what it means in terms of projects um, or in terms of policies uh, or strategies and to show what um, what impacts this have had and how they were generated. Uh, it was it, as Sarah also mentioned, a more bottom-up approach uh, and how the policy can embrace then that approach. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe Hugo, from the, the art or the cultural organization point of view, you would like to share some of your uh, practice with us. Okay. And I think uh, then you need the remote from Sarah. <laughs> If uh, I could have my presentation. Well, I am going to give you two specific examples. Two uh, examples. This was also something that we have also discussed. The first example that you have here, I will say a few words about this project. It's ended in um, 
uh, this show and then I will say something about the, this meeting. The meeting also tries to explore a new design that uh, uh, will be a more conventional idea rather than just showing a, a show. In these two examples, the artistic practices and the processes that were developed have a starting point. This idea of an artistic uh, that is constant and continuous, as well as the possibility of this intervention. So we feel that these spaces are spaces not only of creation, but also uh, spaces of citizenship and democratic experimentation. And so this in some way tries to reactivate uh, this in the daily life of this project. This project uh, is a co-production of uh, the National Theatre of St. Juan in Porto and also the Theatre Dona Maria in Lisboa. This was a project that uh, has taken two years until opening and uh, not considering the previous work. And so uh, time and continuity is absolutely relevant uh, in order to have some efficiency recover regarding participation and involvement. The work that was carried out here in Porto and that has involved more than 200 people, but here figures are not really relevant. There were um, five cores were developed throughout the city in the different regions of the city, east and west, the historical region, where all the uh, stakeholders were discussing the city. And so they organized uh, visits and they would welcome uh, the colleagues from other groups that sometimes have these predetermined ideas of a specific location that they had never visited before. So we tried to explain what diversity was, what it meant, facing this diversity and looking face-to-face uh, -face, uh, instead of just uh, uh, discussing these issues in theory. So all this research work has allowed for this contact to take place, uh, this deconstruction of the, some pre-formed uh, ideas. Work has also allowed to identify what people thought that was not working well in, in the society and in the city. But whenever there was a criticism, two or three solutions should have been presented. And so as a result, we have this show, these tribes that would arrive here at this theatre, they would discuss the city, of course, this was discussed in a poetic and symbolic way. And so this was a project where we were able to further um, analyzed with in-depth this uh, participation and uh, creation and participation. There is an online documentary with English subtitles that uh, in fact uh, the title is uh, Full Body Citizens and it describes this two-year process and it is fully available. My second example My second example uh, is this uh, traditional meeting uh, that is based on four essential axes, presentation, documentation, thinking and uh, the area of training. We usually, for each edition, we welcome 400 people in the city in this event. It takes us two years to prepare this event, so this is why we have an event every two years, because if we want to do in-depth work where we discuss programming with community groups, where we discuss where the project will be implemented, where we survey what are the creations that people believe are more relevant, more urgent to be presented, if we build the image the graphic image of an axis. We also do that in a community forum. If we define the whole of the production of this axis and also 
for instance, housing and welcoming these groups with the involvement of these tireless citizens, we are obviously discussing something that requires time. And so construction is also done with our formal and informal partners. And we have here an example of a project of a group of pregnant person, pregnant women from the last edition that worked with an Italian artist, Caterina Moroni, a march of warrior women discussing the idea that traditionally is associated with pregnant women of fragility or disease. This has been an amazing work and the result and the social impact is something we can discuss. This group of women still, until today, meet. They meet uh, very often to discuss the education of their children. So what started as an art project went well beyond an artistic project. We can move forward to another project. Uh, this was a project of a group from Sao Paulo. This was their name, Collective Occupation, a group of teenagers that in 2015 they were part of a movement that has occupied many schools that were supposed to be closed schools in the state of Sao Paulo without any sustainable explanation. And so this show intends to address the, their occupation by these insurgent bodies when they occupied these schools and let me tell you that at that time I was living in Brazil and I had visited these schools that were being occupied by these students and they didn't just occupy the schools they have proposed these students have proposed how schools should be run they have proposed new items new uh, subjects they have invited teachers so all the enforcement in the area of uh, uh, humanity. They have invited new uh, teachers to uh, address these issues and during some time there was this uh, process of trying to put forward how these schools should be uh, restructured and so sometimes you know things need to be said because otherwise people will just remember this as schools being occupied and I think it's much more than that. This was the work of a group also related to this map of the city how the map of the city could be changed, how could we change the names of the streets and we would name the streets after emotions, for instance. And here, Acho que agora podemos voltar à apresentação so, do Jonathan e por isso então vou dar a oportunidade de voltarmos aos exemplos e à sua visão integrada e ao seu trabalho. Portanto, vou passar agora a palavra ao Jonathan. Jonathan, então, pode apresentar o seu trabalho. Thanks so much, Clementine. Um, I'm very pleased to be involved in the conversation and just uh, very sorry that I can't be with you in person. Um, so my research uh, focuses on cultural policy, cultural participation, and one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is precisely the language that we use, the vocabulary, the concepts, the ideas that we use to frame these conversations. And Hugo has already spoken about the ways in which sometimes we use different terms, different ideas, and sometimes we use the same ideas in different ways from each other. So some of my work has been about cultural democracy, which is a term that many of you will be familiar with uh, in your own practice. And one of the interesting things about the term is the different meanings that it's been given. Um, I'll say something about how it's been used in the UK context, which is the context that I'm most familiar with. And then um, I'm very interested to hear how it's being used um, in the Portuguese context and elsewhere across Europe. So I'm just going to share my slides with you now. So in 2015, the University of Warwick 
um, held a commission into the future of cultural value. And one of their recommendations was to have a campaign which came to be called the Get Creative campaign to celebrate all of the forms of creativity that take place across the UK, but that don't get um, enough attention. And I did research with colleagues at King's College London into the Get Creative campaign. And one of our um, interests was what can be learned from paying attention to everyday creativity in terms of reframing cultural policy. And we um, made use of the language of cultural democracy in a new way. So in the UK context, cultural democracy, which emphasizes cultural agency, had been uh, a popular term in the 1970s and 80s, but very much associated with a particular set of practices, community arts practice, artists going into communities to develop arts projects with them. And the intervention that we made in this report, which was published in 2017, was to say um, three things. Firstly, that if we want to understand um, cultural opportunity, cultural agency, we need to think more broadly than just accessing publicly funded arts and culture. We need to think about cultural ecosystems, and that's a language that I'm hearing Sarah use this morning, thinking about ecologies. So this break dancer that you can see in the photo, he was part of a network of dancers in East London that we worked with. And what we saw so clearly is that the publicly funded arts, everyday creativity and the profit making creative industries were all making possible the opportunities for dancing that these uh, this network of dancers made use of. So then this poses questions in terms of if, if cultural democracy is a system, how can we cultivate it as a system? And I'll, I'll come back to that uh, later on. And then the second intervention was to say, let's make use of the capabilities approach to human development in order to really ask questions about what does opportunity really mean here? So, as many of you will know, the capabilities approach asks, what are the freedoms that people want for themselves and places that at the heart of development? So our approach to cultural democracy really emphasizes deliberation over the, the kinds of cultural opportunities that people in a location want for themselves. Um, and one of the interesting things has been how the language of cultural democracy has really grown in visibility in the UK in these past four or so years. There's now a lot of conversation around cultural democracy and people who were involved in the 1980s with the previous moment of cultural democracy have sort of said, we thought cultural democracy had gone away as an idea and now it's back in a new form. And one policymaker said to me that um, he's all for everyday creativity, and it should be central to what cultural policy is looking to achieve. But cultural democracy is too complicated an idea. We don't know what democracy means in the domain of culture. And in my view, it's part of the challenge of cultural democracy that we have to continue inventing it, just like we have to continue inventing what democracy overall consists of. This will be an ongoing project of, of working out how people govern themselves in terms of their cultural opportunity. So that's that's some of the, the background to my own work. And um, I could move on to sharing a couple of examples, or I could pause there, Clementine, depending on uh, what you prefer. Looking up there and, and explaining so clearly uh, what you're working on, I think uh, it, it's great because it gives really a frame to what we have already started exploring with Hugo, uh, this idea of also asking people what they want, this idea of agency that you can see with the groups uh, of, of students and um, and the, the context of occupying their schools. So to, to just to, to try to wrap it and, and move on to, yeah, to the practice. So I, I'm picking, picking up some terms that you mentioned, both of you. Uh, there is the ecosystem view. So how do we do that in practice? We've, we've seen a little bit at the uh, community and the art, local art 
uh, groups, how this can take place. Um, if we take it from maybe a city level, a, a government point of view, uh, how does that translate? So, uh, Jonathan, from, from a city point of view, because this, I know that you have uh, worked uh, in, the si in, in some cities in the UK, um, so can, can you tell us more about how this works and how do you actually give this agency and how do you um, work across the ecosystem to, to make it flourish, to continue on the metaphor that uh, Sarah was using earlier? Thanks, Clementine. So I'm going to share two examples of a city scale approach. Um, so I'll share my slides again with you now. So the first, yeah, okay, this is the, it's up. the first example I'll share with you is creative people and places. So this is an initiative from Arts Council England that began in 2014. And it's a very interesting um, initiative for a shift in how the Arts Council of England funds culture to a place-based approach, rather than funding just particular arts organisations or particular artists. It's a devolved model. So in order for a town or a city to receive money from the Creative People and Places Fund, they needed to put together a consortium of different organisations, not only cultural organisations, but it could be the university, the local council, local businesses, and they had to de demonstrate how they would work together as a consortium. And they also were encouraged to have creative approaches to decision making. So in a range of different ways, local people would choose how the money would be spent in those locations. And this report, Creating the Environment, was a piece of research that my colleague Nick Wilson and I undertook to understand how the ecosystems were developing around the investment in each of these different locations. And one of the interesting things that we discuss in this report is the range of different strategic aims that had developed within those ecosystems. So some of them were taking quite radical approaches to cultural democracy, a strong focus on the agency of the local populations, and other places took a more conventional approach to audience development, seeking to increase the number of people attending the already existing um, cultural offering in that area. So there have been a range of views in the UK as to, to what extent creative people and places looks like a innovative and interesting model of cultural governance and we could say cultural democracy. Um, but of course, cultural democracy in an ecosystems approach isn't only about how ministries of culture and arts funding agencies spend their money. It's also about civil society. So my second example comes out of a Horizon 2020 research project that I'm currently involved with, uh, with um, 18 researchers across Europe. We're looking at um, 10 small cities across Europe and thinking about what creative economies look like when they're inclusive and sustainable. And one of our cities is Dundee in Scotland. And I just want to share with you one example of an organization that is doing um, work that speaks to what a ecological approach to cultural democracy could consist of. This is an organization called Creative Dundee. It began about 10 years ago, just as a blog. A one woman identified the need to give more visibility to the diverse range of creative life of the city, and also the need to connect people within the city in a, in a better way. So she started writing a blog to do that, and it became so successful that the organization grew and she started running a series of events to bring people together, to connect people, very much connecting the creative and cultural community with community development workers of different kinds. So this is a really interesting example of bridging the cultural sector and the broader community sector 
bridging civil society and the policy process, because Creative Dundee has gone on to play a central role in writing a creative industry strategy for the, for the city. But also, it's a very interesting example of how an organisation has pivoted in the context of COVID, because Creative Dundee has created a digital space for people in the city to imagine what comes next. So this is my fourth point about Creative Dundee, that a cultural organisation can play a specific role in the age of the pandemic, which is to enable a space to imagine the future of a city collectively. So those are my two examples, one that comes out of national policy, but is at a city level, and one which comes out of a grassroots initiative and then speaks into the policy process. Thanks a lot, Jonathan, for, for these examples. I'm quite curious to, to know how, Sarah, you react and relate to these examples. Does that relate to your own experience or do you have a, a different model? You, you started already uh, presenting the way you work with the National Plans for the Art. Um, so, yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I really uh, liked the... the the presentation uh, from Jonathan too, because he's showing us two models, one coming up and one coming from the civil society. And, and this was uh, something that interested us very much when we were um, building up the Porto Santo Charter. And I think it's um, a good time to bring uh, this charter into our conversation um, to say, this is like a tool, a tool for everyone who wants to apply these measures and to really um, wants to imagine uh, different ways of working with communities and peoples. And um, in this um, roadmap, uh, we are proposing policies and practices of culture and education for a more democratic Europe. And uh, within, we propose 38 recommendations for applying and developing this working paradigm for cultural democracy and cultural citizenship. Uh, and it really addresses to different uh, levels of decision making. So uh, we have, um, we proposed uh, recommendations at a governmental levels, um, raising from a national to regional and uh, local um, level of decision-making uh, policies, and as well to EU uh, institutions and member states. Then we have um, a number of recommendations addressed to cultural and educational uh, organizations. And finally, and very importantly, as well to European citizens, uh, calling their action uh, towards a more responsible, a more responsible um, action for uh, addressing uh, our common cultural heritage and cultural landscape. Uh, I, I, I need as well to say that this charter was built up um, by many, many people that we uh, consulted, uh, we discussed with, and we've listened uh, from their experiences, experiences like uh, Jonathan's and Hugo's, um, the, the ones that were here presented, but many others from across all Europe, uh, perif more peripheral um, countries to uh, central countries. And in these discussions, uh, we gathered the voices of representatives of EU member states, uh, European institutions and organizations, European networks, both in the cultural and education sectors. So, uh, uh, the, the 38 measures are combined and they are um, intrinsically related and together they design this uh, compass uh, for social impact of culture and education in art and heritage. And uh, I shall just finish saying that it is very important to think not only in our sector but really uh, build up um, strategies that are cross-sectoral uh, strategies because um, these times that we've lived and all the fragilities that have been uh, exposed namely in the cultural sector and even in the education sector very very much 
they are calling us to think differently and to imagine diff different possibilities. So I don't think there is a question either we can uh, work this manner or not. I think it's uh, mandatory that we work uh, across uh, policy fields and uh, uh, being aware that this is more risk taking, that we are going to exit our comfort zones, that we need to trust and that we need to think uh, in a more creative and diverse, uh, diverse um, manner. And um, it is important as well to think that uh, working together, th there is this word togetherness that is showing up more and more in uh, the discourse. It is um, a way to break the barriers that really separate um, specific uh, ways of thinking and, and, and working in specific fields. And uh, cooperative intelligence was, intelligence was um, in fact the method that we used to uh, design this charter. And I invite you all to um, go and, 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 and see it for yourselves and see if you want to address it in your ways of working, being an institution, a person or a uh, government. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for, for sharing this experience. I would have lots of uh, other questions, but I also see that the time is running, so we'll, we'll try to get through uh, while advancing on the panel. Um, Jonathan, I think, mentioned that col cultural democracy is as much as democracy about reinventing ourselves. So this also uh, brings us to thinking about the future uh, and thinking about the future, taking into consideration the, the situation and what we've lived over the past 15 months. Um, so what do you think, uh, maybe to start with Hugo, um, that what do you think the, uh, the changes have been in relation to the way we understand the artistic work and to the way we we consider it into the city or into the organization? Um, and how do you see uh, the, the future uh, from your uh, experience and maybe give us some, some ideas of your future work? Uh. Um, well, uh, you want to give me a moment, I'm not going to t talk to you about how hard these times are, we all know. I will uh, discuss the opportunity and very clearly I feel an openness uh, towards the debate and towards implementation of actions in this area as I have never felt before and I have been working in this area for 18-20 years so I'm very happy for this, for this opportunity and especially cultural institutions are now doing very important work because they are very clearly understanding that it is now the time for change, for some structural changes. I think that uh, there is a path that was already started when we talk about uh, uh, community uh, and participative institutions and initiatives and there is not really something new that we can propose because there were already experiences that were going on throughout Europe, very interesting, very relevant experiences, and that already had results that were coming out. So from this perspective, what I would like, I would like to underline some things that this context, this climate, can in fact help us to further explore some ex opportunities that the gaps that was so clearly seen by all as a result of the situation can lead to. And I think it is important to consider artistic creation with the possibility of a greater intimacy. And here I would like to underline this idea of intimacy. How do we generate intimacy in the relationship with the audiences and with the creations considering, of course, the diversity of the different audiences. It would be also very interesting to consider how we could develop a greater capacity to take chances. This is the origin of artistic creation and furthermore, when we are working not only with professional artists but with communities as a whole, these chances, this risk is even more necessary and so to take a chance 
in the themes and in the proposals is absolutely essential. This is now the time is right. This is the right timing for this to occur. And also the debate that this rises considering the uh, different uh, perspectives. And then a greater uh, possibility to uh, be closer to the citizens, uh, questioning, uh, properly questioning the separation between art and life and a capacity to reinvent the spaces of creation, presentation, and even the devices, the instruments are relating with the different audiences. Cultural institutions nowadays, they were already in the past, but nowadays cultural institutions can be much more than just buildings where things are taking place. This path was already uh, being um, sought. And then very clearly the capacity to further improve and to open more towards aesthetics that are different and not just try and make all the aesthetics that take place in different places all the same, all uniform. This is very little if we look as what we are as humanity and there's something that we really need to grab very clearly right now. Then I think that what this brings us is this idea of exploring spaces that are non-conventional spaces that can include spaces, cultural locations and their invention and transformation in some way and these locations, these sites can be experienced and planned and thought of based on designs that are more connected with humanity and with nature, with concerns of environmental sustainability, but also with concerns of sustainability in the creation, in the circulation of the work of art, and of course in the programming. And for this, this is also a very interesting opportunity to further uh, discuss uh, um, the experiences regarding citizens and regarding cultural programming that is something that is still only starting in Europe, something that we have to further discuss when people are being summit, when people are being invited in some way and when we arrive at the debate of the cultural agenda, it is still very frail and very vertical. And here we have a very interesting path to follow and as I say, when the cultural agendas are implemented, people already know because the work has already been done. People already know what they are going to watch, why they are going to watch, what they have chosen to watch. And obviously these forums of debate, of course, should also involve cultural policies. How the citizens can be present in this debate as we are here today, as we're present here today. This is absolutely essential in this very integrated idea uh, between the definition of cultural policies as well as just like cultural or social or environmental or educational policies. So this is absolutely relevant and if I show you very quickly this graph, a very colorful graph that I'm going to show you, thank you, this study that was carried out with 250 people here in Portugal regarding their cultural involvement and their artistic involvement. I would ask for technical support. So this has to do with the quality of participation. I will address this later. You can see very clearly, let's focus on the first three lines. You can see very clearly that these citizens once they have a relationship with community and participative processes, they have a cultural involvement in the community in other areas that has been clearly enlarged. And this is their perception in other types of initiatives. On the other hand, we also have another growth of the involvement in actions in educational and training actions and thirdly the involvement in social and um, civic actions so we can't have this perception 
perception. And here you have this study with 250 people who are involved in these activities. And this tells us very clearly that this relationship is not just a very wide or subjective or imaginative um, participation. No, there is something that has to do with critical thinking, with creativity, with the will to learn that crosses these t different types of participation. And to end with this idea of present and future, I always like to resort to this necessary utopia. This is one artist for each community, for each borough, so that this artist will be acknowledged as this local artist in their way, in the specific way of creation and this seems essential so that this will uh, have the possibility of generating outstanding and relevant moments in the, the routines of those people that inhabit these territories and for this for the artist to be acknowledged as such and the creation to be acknowledged as such does not necessarily involve uh, a conventional space or a cultural institution and so I think that this is an utopia that is a necessary utopia for what we're discussing here as a cultural democracy and I would really want to share this with you as an idea that is an uh, idea that is still uh, uh, in ongoing, it's still in progress, and we are all responsible for this idea. Muito obrigada. Eu tenho uh, I think you made your point very clear and to, to, yeah, in this idea of thinking about the future and bringing uh, some recommendations forward, uh, maybe I would like to, like to ask Jonathan also uh, his, uh, his point of view on how does this mean, uh, what are the, uh, the needs to be addressed and how we can do this uh, in thinking about the future and, and, uh, and making this cultural democracy uh, really alive and uh, revitalizing for our whole society. So please, Jonathan. Thanks, Clementine. So, so as we know, COVID-19 has um, raised so many questions about how we live together and what the future um, could look like and, and should look like. And I just want to draw out one discussion in the UK context around the politics of care. So let me share my slides in order to do that. So in the UK, in the first months of the pandemic, a clap for carers began. Every Thursday evening, people would come out of their homes and show their gratitude to health workers, to emergency services, for people looking after children, for all of the care workers that were helping to respond to the pandemic. So COVID has given new visibility to all of the ways that we care for each other, that policy supports us to care for each other. But this needs to be located within a longer history of discussing care within feminist um, writing, such as Joan Tronto, whose book you can see here. And I think it's a very interesting question for cultural policy as to what its role is within practices of care and mutual support. And actually some of these conversations about what the role is of culture within systems of care were taking place even before COVID-19. So the photo that you can see on the right hand side was a conference held in Leicester in 2000 uh, 18 about the role of care in the creative industries and some of my own writing that you can see in these reports is also thinking about the relationship between care and culture and so what I want to say um, in terms of where uh, cultural organizations cultural policy might go in response to COVID is to emphasize the role of cultural organizations, of artists, of policymakers, in meeting the needs of their communities, which is precisely what care is. It's identifying people's needs, it's taking responsibility for meeting those needs, and doing so with skill. 
So some of you will be familiar with the Kalus Gulbenkian Foundation's work on the civic role of arts organisations. And I think we're seeing a new civic role for arts organisations in meeting people's needs at a time of crisis. We see with Creative Dundee, the organisation that I showed you before, an organisation that's pivoting to meet new needs in the pandemic situation, which is precisely the need to imagine what the city will look like beyond the pandemic. So um, for, for me, this is um, the key point to emphasise that cultural organisations already had a civic role, but they're meeting new needs at this time of crisis. Uh, and specifically, those are imaginative needs, how to imagine the future at this time. And we can think about this in terms of hope, which is something that I've also written about. How can we create conditions in which we can tell new stories about where we're going together? That's one of the key needs of this time, and that's one of the key things that cultural organisations can help us to do. So my, my final uh, thought here is that we need to make cultural organisations and cultural policy more civic, but we also need to make the civic process more cultural, bringing the imaginative resources of arts and cultural organisations into the present moment in which we're needing to tell new stories about where we're going together. Thanks a lot, Jonathan, for, for those uh, inspiring thoughts. Um, Sarah, any plans for the future? How do you reflect in the context of the Porto Santo Charter, but also beyond? Uh, what are you up to next? And, and what would be your, your key takeaway for, for this session? Um, I, I, I shall firstly say that I'm really glad to uh, listen to this conversation and see how much the Charter is addressing all the subjects that we are talking um, about. Uh, and, and giving insights to build a practice uh, on, on these ideas. And this is definitely important, not to remain in words, but really uh, come to practice. I really um, um, appreciate this idea of care, which was something that we uh, thought about longly, uh, that institutions have to shift from the idea of service to the idea of caring for. And this is, has all to do with um, social impact to be uh, more near to the ones that you are working with and really ask uh, the question uh, that uh, is so important to and, and, and it comes from what difference are you making in this community? And uh, another uh, question is if you have to close tomorrow, who is going to cry for you? Who is going to go at the door and defend what you're doing? This is really social impact. And this is what, uh, these are the difficult questions that institutions have to pose themselves if they are uh, close enough to um, society, if they are really relevant and uh, that they need to go uh, over service to caring. And so, so this will be uh, definitely my, my, my um, suggestion for imagining the future. Ask, how, ask every day how can culture and art help in building up uh, uh, a better uh, future, in imagining these uh, hopeful scenarios, because democracy uh, needs uh, hope. And, and hopes need creativity to be um, devolve, uh, to be um, uh, developed. So uh, this um, interconnection um, helps us um, understand how uh, cultural is so impactful in society in very very different levels. Um, so so my, my my final recommendations would def definitely be to uh, improve in the training for this new model because words uh, matter and we are uh, sometimes not using the words in the right sense as uh, we've uh, talked about uh, this morning. So um, spread uh, training courses, sp uh, spread the, 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 the way how we should work uh, in collaboration in a more horizontal way um, help people 
to be uh, active in decision-making process, be, uh, make this decision relevant and useful and, and effective. Don't ask if you're not able to turn this um, propos proposition into real actions and um, help uh, um, ask everyone to safeguard heritage. Ask everyone to be proud to the place where they belong and to think uh, in, in an inclusion, in, inclusion manner, meaning that we need to think uh, more diversely if we want to um, understand the values of Europe. Uh, Europe is diverse and uh, it's in diversity that it uh, reaches its, its uh, richness. And so culture and, and, and education must be hand in hand to build these um, territories that of hope, of care, and uh, that are truly meaningful and impactful for everyone and for the whole society. Many, many thanks, Sarah. I hope this, uh, these final words will have inspired you, um, maybe also to ask questions to our panelists here on stage or uh, on the internet. Um, so I'll, I'll open, before wrapping it up uh, completely, I'll open the floor uh, to any questions you would like to ask to Hugo, Sarah and uh, Jonathan. Um, so I don't see you very well because of the lightning, but uh, yes, please don't hesitate to raise hands or speak out. Um, I think there is a mic that, is, uh, that can circulate in the audience. Yeah, if you have a question, maybe please stand up because I really cannot see you. <laughs> And if you, yeah, ah, okay, I see. If you don't have any question, I might have one uh, actually uh, very briefly um, because we, we've talked a lot about decision making and maybe in a way sharing ownership also of the project, listening to the needs uh, of the communities, uh, listening to their hopes maybe. Um, are there in your experience new uh, models of governance, how to work together between these different groups? Uh, um, Jonathan mentioned the publicly funded the private profit making and the community. Are you experiment, experimenting maybe in your works, uh, uh, starting with Hugo, uh, new organization or new governance models uh, that you could share with us or any experiments you've been, uh, uh, may, and maybe uh, unsuccessful ones, but uh, it would be interesting to know if there are new ways of working together. Uh, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> I think that try to organize, to summarize what we've been discussing, which is not really easy, but uh, besides this integrated perspective between cultural policies, educational, social and environmental policies that I've mentioned, not from a perspective of uh, creating homogeneous narratives. One thing is common vocabulary so that we can understand each other regarding the goals. Something else is a unique vocabulary that, as we know, is extremely uh, dangerous and it's not something we want. So, from the perspective of complementing how these policies can be implemented and integrated and how they can reflect an added value of the quality of the, past, the cultural and artistic participation and maybe we could spend some time here discussing this quality that is a whole set of elements that uh, assures the greater relevance towards the development of the critical thought, citizenship and democracy also in the art, 
in the arts. And this includes a shared decision-making process, uh, thinking about the issues, artistic approaches that will cross the dimension, uh, the community, social and artistic dimension. It involves a whole set of elements that I'm not going to mention here, but of course that if you want to have access to this information, it is uh, published and it seems absolutely essential to have this into account because many of the participating processes are very often to, are just beginning and they are in fact just an illusion and this causes this sense of lack of efficiency when we participate to participate is to be a part of is to assume a commitment is to assume a responsibility it means to communicate it means to have a space to express uh, one another. And if we feel that this participation does not have a consequence, that our participation does not influence the decision-making process uh, from the community group we are working on, a dance, a theatre and music group, uh, all the way to uh, the instances that are connected with representative democracy, it is very difficult for us to continue somehow to continue to believe that uh, our involvement, our participation is worthwhile and participation is worthwhile when there is quality. It's not just for the sake of being involved in artistic processes. It, this does not by itself bring positive eff uh, effects. There is a whole set of elements that must be assured so that each individual will feel that they are involved, that they are just an instrument. Even if it is just a very uh, specific project, they can be filled with quality and participation. One thing is uh, participation, the other thing is that they may not even be projects that are, will be continued through time, but you can have uh, excellent punctual isolated processes that have a huge level of quality so there is not a clear bond between clear involvement and clear relevance of the project and the, the, the continuing of the process so probably policies that will incentivate the structuring the sustainability of these practices of course with the right follow-up the follow-up that should include that should include the voice of the participants of this particular type of practice. This is also something that we've carried out a survey in this area and they are all from the perspective of the researchers, the artists, the anthropologists, the sociologists, the social technicians, and only very rarely there is a direct connection with the perception of this aesthetic experience that people develop. This is absolutely essential and this is essential for the assessment and the follow-up of the implementation of cultural policies, creating the proper instruments, the proper tools that will allow for this continuous uh, follow-up and that it will also be able to make the necessary adjustments. It's also very important from this perspective to uh, 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 analyze this type of participation, cultural and artistic participation, as a space that on one hand it allows for the reinvention of the artistic creation in itself and on the other hand the reinvention of political interventions as well as social intervention. That is, if we want to go from micro into macro, how to understand that micro policies that develop from this type of project in this type of practices can be increased and can have a reading that is a more macro reading regarding public policies, for instance. Obviously, and I'm going to reinforce uh, fostering these policies based on aesthetics, ways of different ways of production goes well beyond just the words. This is something that I believe is urgent, that should be absolutely very seriously considered. Otherwise, very undesirable things might happen as we are all experiencing. And then you can ask, how can you do that in practice? We could discuss many ideas, networks, sustainable networks, uh, programming between territories that at the same height will, same way will also include uh, programming as well as networks that will define cultural programming based with the local artists, the social and environmental artists and for that it is also 
necessary to have a, a very strong work of empowerment and developing a common vocabulary very closely associated with endogenous features of the territories. But this work should not be carried out only at the local level. This work should always be carried out in a profound dialogue with the diversity of all the global territory. Otherwise, there is the risk that these conceptions will be restricted and very much confined to a very specific uh, micro, micro vision. And obviously, and please allow me to add, because I also have a whole set of ideas that we can discuss at the later stage. Uh, in the debate, obviously, it seems to me that it's absolutely essential, and as I'm quite familiar with the Portuguese and Spanish reality in Europe, uh, European reality, and also the reality of Latin America, but focusing in the European context, I believe it's essential that this perspective, this vision, will also be carried out into the schools that train artists, but also the schools that train in anthropologists, psychologists, sociologists, teachers, and so. If in this basic training, in this basic education, we do not have, uh, we are always underlining this need for this integrated vision, we believe that further ahead it will be much more difficult to implement because there will be habits, uh, work habits that will be already acquired. So there's still something that needs to be done at the basic foundation. There are different curricula, different course plans that have been restructured and where these visions are being implemented, we have to continue with this path. We have to further continue working along these lines in order to be able to achieve the care, the care we've been discussing here, the details, and also to repair our hope that is so something that is so much needed nowadays. Muito obrigado e penso que entretanto há questões que surgiram. Otherwise, I will maybe let Sarah and, and Jonathan reflect on the idea of quality is something that the Porto uh, Santo Charter does mention and the balance with quality and excellence. I don't know if there's something you want to, to add on and, and then, yeah, we, we can close also on the and one another aspect that um, Hugo mentioned and that maybe Jonathan would like to react upon is how we assess and follow up and to make sure that we uh, do have this impact of cultural activities. É absolutamente determinante para este projeto. And this is absolutely required if you want to, to have the, the results, to reach these results. And I don't mean that we are looking only at the results. We, uh, I, I, I want to s uh, stress out that the, the, the results are already in the process. And when you have uh, artists that can work um, well and engage with communities, you have uh, definitely uh, impacts that last uh, much longer. I, I want to come back as well to the, the former question, which is very important. How, how do you bring a new model of governance into practice? And we are um, in the National Plan for the Arts already doing so um, in, within the schools. Uh, because we, we um, created uh, boards for decision making and, and advisory boards too in the school so that the whole group, which is very diverse and includes um, representatives from the municipalities, from the theatre, local theatre and local uh, museum, um, artists from, from the region and very much the, the students themselves. And these boards, they decide how will the cultural project of that school will involve, will develop, and uh, which um, uh, issues do, you, do they want to address? And doing so, we are uh, really um, building up a, a democratic uh, model of governance that comes already in the school, and it's um, moreover an educative model too, 
because you are applying direct democracy in this regard uh, in the school and as well representative too. So I think um, in the charter there is one recommendation that aims uh, that um, museums, theatres, uh, cultural organisations call up members of the community and uh, there is a, a underlying, uh, um, uh, an underlying stress on calling up young people for these boards so that the decision-making process about these institutions is not only made by the ones that are in the institution, but by the ones that represent the diversity of uh, the, the society this institution is working for. So uh, quality is important. Quality is important not only in the results, but in the process and uh, decision-making and, and sharing power um, comes from early stages. It must be like Google said before, already in the school, but it must be built up uh, in society, uh, in institutions, and at different levels. And th there are several uh, recommendations in the Porto Santo Charter about this, how to build it, how to make it. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I think we've come to the end of our panel. Maybe I'll just leave Jonathan in one sentence if you want to add something, because uh, you're not with us physically, uh, so I can't see maybe you just want to add one sentence and then we'll close this panel. I encourage you to continue the discussion then over the, the day for those who have the, the chance to be on site. Thank you, Clementine. So I'll just, I'll just add in terms of cultural governance, I think it would be a really valuable project for us to build up a set of examples of creative approaches to cultural governance to recognize that cultural decision-making is part of cultural capability, cultural opportunity. So we should uh, integrate it within what we're trying to achieve in expanding cultural democracy, that people are involved in creative ways in making decisions about the cultural life of their neighborhood and their city. And, and thanks so much for, for today's conversation to all our panelists thank you to the translators and the interpreters as well um, so we'll continue the discussion with the uh, more specific panel discussions now and of course we are very happy to uh, discuss uh, during the breaks um, and uh, i think these conclusions will also be written down in the report of the conference so thank you very much